Okay, um, thank you so much everyone, um, and it's, um, it's my very great pleasure um, to now have the opportunity to introduce our keynote um, speaker today. So we are joined uh, by Professor Sean Bain, who's come down from the University of Edinburgh, and we're very, very grateful uh, for her making the journey. Thank you, Sean. Um, so to give a bit of information about Sean's background and, and current work, um, so Sean is Professor of Digital Education at the University of Edinburgh, where she directs the Centre for Research in Digital Education and leads on higher education futures in her role as assistant principal. So no, no one better to really speak to our themes and, and introduce some of those themes uh, for our programme today. Um, Sean describes her research as critical, creative, exploratory, interdisciplinary. It's focused on futures, utopias, uh, theories of enhancement. She's one of the authors of the Manifesto for Teaching Online and gives regular keynotes on the future of digital education and publishes widely uh, and conducts research funded by UKRI, Erasmus, Advanced AG and NEFTA. Um, when we were thinking about a keynote uh, for today, it was actually my colleague, um, Jenny Carr, who, who is currently in Paris. So it's, um, she's having a great time. Thank you, Jenny. But she um, sent me a link to um, Sean's recently published Actions Towards a Digital Education um, Utopia, um, which I found really kind of fantastically insightful as a way to think about today, because what those actions and, and what Sean's work kind of around the manifestos does is it takes um, or attempts to move us from I guess speculative, theoretical, uh, methodology-oriented work to some um, implications for practice. And what I really hope, and I think we're going to see today, is a bit of both of that um, from Sean in, in um, the presentation. So I'm going to hand over. Um, Sean will, will speak with us for around 30 minutes, I think, yeah. and, which will give us plenty of time for lots of questions as well afterwards. Um, so if you join me in welcoming Sean. Thank you. Alex for that introduction. Um, it's, it's really nice to be here in London, sunny and quite a few degrees warmer than Edinburgh, so a nice little trip for me. Um, yes, as, as, as Alex said, I direct our Centre for Research in Digital Education, um, big interdisciplinary research centre. Um, I'm also strongly affiliated with the Edinburgh Futures Institute, which is a new institute we've literally just opened this week after about seven years of renovation the old Royal Infirmary in the centre of, um, the center of Edinburgh, which is 200,000 metres square of interdisciplinary research and teaching. So it's a really exciting time for us and a, a great time to be thinking um, about the future of education. Um, I, I worked previously as Director of Education for the Futures Institute, so I did have a chance to put some of these ideas into practice through the design of that education portfolio. Um, but today, this is what I'm going to talk about. I'm talking about higher education futures, um, kind of through the lens of digital, but of course digital doesn't stand alone. It's very much interconnected with all the other things that we're concerned about at the moment, particularly around the funding landscape, um, climate change, broader social, um, environmental and academic futures. Um, so I'm going to say a little bit about how, we ha how the context of digital higher education is very contested. There are multiple contested futures that are kind of converging on it, coming from different stakeholders and different parts of the community. Um, and then, so that bit's a bit gloomy, for which I apologise in advance. Um, but then I'm going to turn to looking, to talking very briefly about utopia and speculative methods as a way of keeping the future open. Um, and then the second half of the talk, I'm going to focus on some speculative scenarios for the future of higher education that we have been working on over the last couple of years um, in my research centre. Um, and I'll introduce those to you. And, Hopefully that will open up discussion, if not today, then at some other point um, among colleagues here. Okay. Oh, yes, I should say I've got I've scattered quite a few references through this talk, so rather than try and, you know, put people under loads of pressure to like write them down, I put them all in a Google Doc, which is there, so that you may want to take a screen grab or a, a photograph of the screen. Um, and I hope people online can hear me okay, but please, please shout if, if not. Um, okay, so higher edu digital higher education, it's contested futures. I think, there are, as I said, there are multiple kinds of versions of the future converging on what we do in higher education, particularly when it comes to digital spaces. I think there are corporate, there are corporate visions, ed tech visions, there are academic stroke activist um, futures, policy futures, and other kinds of futures from supranational, supranational agencies. And I think sometimes the 
the discussion within universities gets really quite muddied and, mu and kind of finds it quite difficult to navigate through these other futures, which often are actually more clearly articulated than they are within universities. And I think that is a, can be a problem for higher education, is that we are sometimes not great at telling, a, a kind of driving the narrative of what we want the future of universities to look like, particularly when it comes to digital technologies. Um, so just to give a really brief intro and sort of some examples of what I'm talking about, we have these big corporate futures, and this has been a narrative which has been going on for a decade or more, longer in fact, as long as I've been working in higher education, which is about 20 years now, which is that universities are not agile enough to adapt to technological change, um, that we're broken, that we're businesses, but our business models are broken, and that we need some kind of fix that would likely come from the private sector or the edtech industry to make us future ready. And so we end up with kind of really quite influential reports coming from some of the big consultancies like well this was one from a couple of years ago that EY produced around our universities of the past still the future you know you don't have to be an expert in discourse analysis to see what they're doing with the title of this report right they're kind of framing the university as history and the future as something else and then you know this kind of um this kind of graphic which is not particularly easy to interpret. <coughs> you can kind of see what what this is doing. It's saying to universities, you are you are here at the bottom of this sort of grey, depressing-looking triangle, and then where you need to get is here in this kind of beautiful, vibrant yellow cone thing. Um, there's a narrative here which is we, we we could laugh at it, but actually, you know, EY and other big consultancies are selling their expertise to institutions like ours um, to help us get to here which is this sort of rather um, odd um, model where humans are supposed to be at the center but are actually not. <laughs> <laughs> so um, th this report I found particularly chilling because it, it talks about peak higher education being what we've got now or what we had in 2022 and tomorrow's future vision being the, the knowledge services sector. So this report said quite specifically it's the end of, uni at the end of universities as we know them all hail the knowledge services sector. So that gives us something to think about. Um, and then we have the edtech industry futures, which are another um, very dominant kind of um, way of thinking about what higher education teaching should be. Um, so these tend to be framed around this idea that disruption is inevitable. Um, uh, Larry, I think in that last session was really interesting to hear you mention MOOCs as this kind of legacy ancient old thing that everyone laughs at now, but it was going to be the thing that changed and disrupted all of higher education forever and universities would die and the rest of it. And that's happening again now with AI, it happens all the time, it even happened with virtual worlds. Um, so this is a cycle, it's not a kind of, it's never a one-off. Um, and often the future of higher education or education generally is very much tied in these tech visions to growth in markets um, for educational technology. And they are focused around, not so much around what we might see as the purpose of education as a social good, but around education, uh, about education's profit um, and, and a market opportunity. So data extraction often features very, very significantly here, um, as well as all the technologies that we, we are talking about at the moment around AI, smart campuses, and so on. So this is this is a projection that Holon IQ did. It was this comes from August 2020 when we were right, obviously, in the middle of the pandemic, sort of projecting what ed tech spend would be over the coming years. Actually, it hasn't. It hasn't kind of the growth hasn't been as significant as this as this particular um, graphic <coughs> suggested it might be. What I think is interesting about this graphic is the way that it attaches models and priorities for teaching and learning to this question of market growth. So it starts with, oh, everybody's you know, not, not very good back in 2018, 2019, a bit rubbish at remote learning, but it's getting normalized. And then we've got the kind of move into the sort of cloud infrastructures and so on, um, rise of uh, business to consumer ed tech models. And then we've got this projection into the future where this is nothing, this isn't really about ed tech or uh, technological um, innovation. It's about attaching the way we teach within universities and schools to technological development. So it's, it's very much assuming and normalizing a very tech-driven model of teaching. And that's problematic in the school sector. It's also problematic in higher education. And then we have um, academics, and I said academic activists because in the field I work in, which is critical digital education, it's 
often people are quite far activists. And often it's one of the places where people are really pushing back on some of these corporate and edtech um, models. So we tend to see a much more, um, well, a very much more critical kind of perspective on these futures. So I, I, I'm sure colleagues in the room have read Jonathan Ferry's um, book on scorched earth. I mean, for, for Crary, the, the internet complex cannot be disentangled from advanced capitalism and all the problems that we know that's now creating for climate and so on. So in his model of the future, it's a future without an internet, certainly without an internet as we currently see it. So digital is highly problematic. And we do know that the digital technology industry is one of the least sustainable um, industrial sectors in the modern world. The levels of waste, of um, resource usage, of unjust labor practices, of, you know, we, we all know those are extremely troubling. Um, we also know, and this is again a, a critical perspective on the impact of digital technology on universities, that it has, it has had some negative trajectories around entrenching the privatisation of public education, normalising surveillance regimes and standardisation and so on. And I'll say a bit more about that as we go through. This is a quote from one of Neil Selwyn's recent articles. Um, so then we have these sort of international agency and policy futures. I've bundled quite a few things together here because I don't have all day. I've only got half an hour. Um, but I think what we, what we see with these kinds of the visions coming from, say, UNESCO um, and those coming from the government or the EU or the EC are very different. We have this humanistic paradigm which tends to come from it's, uh, agencies like UNESCO which emphasises education is a social good and it's emancipatory and democratic social agendas and then we have a very strongly economistic and utilitarian paradigm um, that come, tends to come from government policy um, at, at the UK and the EU level and elsewhere. Um, so we can see in that, I thought the last UNESCO Futures of Education report was really good. It was almost like one of the lone voices out there talking about actually what do we think education is for um, in terms of social good and human well-being, human flourishing. Um, and this report emphasised that technology is potentially problematic. Yes, it, can, it has potential to emancipate, but it also has potential for repression. Uh, but then when you look at kind of uh, the UK national AI strategy, for example, the focus is all on uh, skills gaps, workforce of the future, talent pipelines, and it's similar with the EU um, Digital Education Action Plan as well. So, again... When we come to that, thinking about university futures then, I think sometimes all these different, these different discourses converge um, and make it very difficult. And we all know we're probably all sitting in committees and working groups and task forces looking at digital transformation, at digital skills, at digital research, digital estate. We certainly are at Edinburgh. Um, yet sometimes there's no really clear sense of a shared and collective um, kind of vision of what it is we actually want the university to be in this digital world. So this is probably my most depressing slide. I'm, I'm hoping this is like, this is, <laughs> things are going to start to pick, pick up a bit from here on, but we are seeing these troubling trajectories in higher education where this, well, Neil Selwyn's comment on privatisation of education, diversification of the sector, um, largely in favour of private organisations, often driven by digital technologies or at least digital promise. Um, universities as a whole are very, very dependent on um, for, in terms of the infrastructure on the big tech corporations, on Amazon Web Services and others, um, over which we have very little say, very relatively uh, low democratic control over those infrastructures. Um, we are seeing a normalisation of surveillance uh, architectures within universities. I don't think there's anywhere in the UK at the moment who, that does facial recognition. Correct me if I'm wrong, if someone knows of one. Um, but we, are, we, but we, are, we have normalised data dashboards for students, um, we've normalised, they're built into our learning, uh, our learning management systems, um, we've, we've normalised attendance, um, monitoring and so on, so that we're on a trajectory there I think. Uh, we're seeing the instrumentalisation of education increasingly and also the homogenisation of teaching methods because we're seeing a lot of creative innovation in terms of the teaching that we do being sort of forced to fit into our enterprise platforms um, in a way which does tend to flatten them. Um, and then there's always this promise this, uh, of scaling without staffing. Well, look, these digital technologies can make you help you do more with less, um, which you know often doesn't go down very well with academic communities for good reasons because we know it's not true. Um, 
Okay, so what do we, what, where can we turn to to kind of feel better? <laughs> um, there, is, there is a turn, and I'm, I'm sure colleagues in the room that work in this, uh, kind of social science or education kind of areas are, are aware of the turn to utopia um, in some of the thinking that's happening around this at the moment and to speculative method. So I'll just say a little bit of it, a little bit more about utopia. Um, this is a quote from Ruth Levitas's book on. Um, she knows it from a paper she wrote, but she, she writes about, she's written extensively, she's one of the founding scholars, I would say, of contemporary um, utopian scholarship. And she says, well, look, if what we have to do is demand the impossible. And the things that seem impossible now in the context of all those kind of futures that I've just been describing, um, we have to push, push against those and, and demand the impossible. Otherwise, all we will get is more of the same, more of what we have now. Um, so I think it, I, I personally feel really excited by this kind of shift to contemporary utopian studies and this, I think we've kind of parked the idea of utopia as a kind of a, a failure of real world pragmatism or totalitarian and so on. And actually a new kind of utopian scholarship is opening up, which is much more about seeing the possibility of utopia as a way of keeping the future open. Um, it's, it's a kind of source of perhaps of hope. And for me, one of the most useful foundational concepts of contemporary utopia. This is one from Miguel Avansor, who talks about utopia not as, not as in terms of creating blueprints for an ideal future society, but as being about the education of desire. And actually, for me, this seems like a really nice way of thinking about what the function of education might be more broadly. Um, it's to educate desire better um, than educate it otherwise, um, to stimulate it, to awaken it. Yeah, that's just what I'm saying now. Um, so I do think we had, returning back specifically to digital education, I think when I, when I was doing my PhD, again, yeah, it was about 20 or so years ago, um, and there was a kind of utopic sense of possibility around digital technologies back then. Um, this sense of, I don't know if anyone else remembers that feeling of um, almost the adrenaline rush when you realise how connected you were to other people um, by using the internet in those early days, of like early 2000s or whatever. Um, and this, all this kind of invigoration of democracy that was promised through um, digital technologies and reimagined relationships between humans and machines. And I think we have lost a lot of that over the last 20 years. You know, now all the things that I've been talking about, this kind of marketized, platformized, uh, surveillance oriented, extractive um, infrastructures that we're now working within. So we need to get. I think we need to get some of this sense of promise back, and I think it's feasible and possible to do that, but we do it, I think, in forums like this one, where we get together and we talk about and imagine alternative futures um, for higher education. Um, it's been very interesting seeing as, well, as the kind of utopian scholarship is, seems to be really taking off, so is the scholarship on speculative methods, um, sort of across, com, coming, I guess, from design disciplines, but now really widely um, adopted within you know, more social sciences, um, speculation as a way of working with the future as a space of uncertainty, but keeping hope open, I think is really exciting. Um, so what I want to do now, yeah, I've got about another 15 minutes, is um, talk about scenarios for the future of higher education that we've been developing at Edinburgh over the last few years. And these are drawing directly on the kind of speculative methods and speculative scholarship that um, has been happening, as well as on some of the scholarship around utopia. Um, so what we did is, oh, probably about two years ago, we started the process of developing a set of scenarios based on what might education look like in the higher education, look like in the future. And we never set a kind of, we didn't set a time frame for this. It was just a kind of looking at the research and the trajectories that we know that universities are kind of facing at the moment, what futures might we be inhabiting as um, scholarship, as communities of scholarship um, in the future. So we developed these eight new speculations. Uh, we presented them in this kind of tarot cards. I'll show you them in a minute. And we also wrote a set of microfictions to, to accompany them. I haven't got time today to share the microfictions, but they're all available on our website at that link. The link's also in the Google document. And there, we put a Creative Commons license on them, so they're reusable. Um, so lots and lots of people have been reusing them around around the world. It's been really heartening um, to have conversations and support these kind of utopia-oriented conversations with colleagues and students. Um, so please feel free to, um, to share and reuse should you wish to. 
So these are the eight scenarios, and I'm going to talk you through them. Um, when we use these in workshop sort of contexts, it's very it's e easy uh, for colleagues to sort of go down the route of, um, I don't know, I'm just joking, the vortex gets sucked into sort of a sense of hopelessness. So generally, when we when we use them, we ask we ask colleagues, you know, look at the scenarios and think about what would a good university look like in this context? What is a desirable future? Um, so we don't have time for anything very participative today, but it would be, if we have time for comments at the end, I'd really like to know whether this works for you and whether you can imagine good or desirable higher education futures when you look at these scenarios. Um, so I've chosen two of them to drill into in a bit more detail. So for the first one is one called enhanced enhancement. Okay, so this is a future in which Routine cognitive enhancement is normal. Um, big pharma and robotics, AI industries have lobbied. There's very limited regulation. Um, and enhancement technologies are being rolled out across all sectors, from sport to education, whatever. Um, almost all students and staff use smart drugs and electronic neurostimulation to, because they need them to enable this extreme focus and endurance. Um, needed for academic work um, and then this is a future in which brain data dominates the data industry um, yet at the same time it has given birth to a kind of new off-grid citizen and freedom movements um, so this is obviously this is based on research we know that big pharma is one of the world's biggest industries and it's the biggest <coughs> industry spender in the u.s on political lobbying um, we know that big tech lobbies um, spend, also spends a lot of money on lobbying. Um, so in the uh, run up to the to the recent EU Digital Services Act, there was a real investment in lobbying in, um, in the Commission. Um, we know that smart drug usage is beginning to be normalised, probably in higher education. It's hard to get exact data on this, but the studies that we have indicate that students and increasingly staff are are using cognitive enhancers for wakefulness and focus. Um, and we know that there is a growing investment in educational neurotechnology. Um, the most common one is our EEGs, um, you know, sensors on the head, which promise to measure cognition, um, which is easy to correlate to attention in class. So all kinds of edtech promise coming from that new data source. It's a bit hard to see a utopia within this particular <laughs> scenario. Um, I suppose you could just about imagine if, if, if there was this new, what Ayenka and Adorno have said, if, if, if something like this raised the profile of the need for us to have serious conversations about cognitive liberty and psychological continuity, that might be a good thing. Um, otherwise, it looks a bit, yeah, a little bit like Mero, yeah. Um, okay, this, I'll, I'll run you through a few of the other, the other scenarios now in a bit more, um, just a bit more briefly. So the AI Academy, this is one we were already quite familiar with. AI has become our university infrastructure. It's doing everything from admissions to literal use to student assessment. It's, it's um, amplifying the, the emergent surveillance culture that we already have um, in universities. Um, behavioral data has been harvested constantly and fed back to administrators. But people don't want, they either don't mind or they don't say they mind because they, because basically that's how the university runs. Um, we don't need assessment anymore. The students' capacities are categorised instantly by their analysis of their various kinds of personal data, which may include brain data. Again, I can see I can see a utopia here. I mean, but it would require the AIs that we're working with to be loads better than they are right now. Um, but you can imagine that if it was genuinely true um, that you could use an AI as a research assistant and do help get it to help you do reliable literature reviews, for example, or do some of the heavy lifting around um, recruitment and admissions and so on, that might that would that could be good and it could free up our time um, to do to do more of the interesting stuff potentially. Um, the, the third scenario is around the, the idea of the universal university, so various social and environmental shifts have meant that it's um, more or less impossible for people to attend university on campus, so mo almost all the student body is online. Um, but we've developed these new online teaching models which enable our educational experiences to remain rich and experiential, um, and we've got advances in virtual reality to give a sense of co-presence. And then that's been accompanied in this scenario by policy shifts um, to mandate new routes to access meaningfully um, across the, the resource-rich nations. 
Um, the next one is extreme unbundling. So this is where universities, as, we have, as we've understood them in the 20th century, have sort of more or less disappeared. Everything has become fragmented and outsourced. Teaching um, is now provided directly to students by academics connected through global platforms. Um, it's enabled a lot, of, a lot more lifelong learning perhaps than we have now. Um, but it's, it, research has had to position itself differently through kind of industry funded research collectives. Um, so the next one, justice driven innovation. So this one is kind of imagining a post, a post revolution sort of environment for universities where growing levels of societal division and um, wealth inequalities have prompted really radical change. Um, so we've become, the main function of universities in this model has become to address um, these dramatic social challenges. So disciplines have faded away um, and we have a, a more radical transdisciplinarity within universities, a growth in really local autonomous uh, communities and ecoversities around the world and lots of really nice, strong ac academic activist partnerships um, community-based movements kind of working through universities. I quite like that one. Um, return to the ivory tower. So we have completely failed to widen participation. Ooh, <laughs> um, yeah, we failed to widen participation. Um, state funding has been declined. Automation has hollowed out. Um, Kind of social mobility uh, kind of dimension of universities so only the elite can now study at a higher level everyone else gets micro credentials delivered online or something um, the gated physical campus is, is, is once more the locus of university life i find it difficult to imagine a good in this one i have to say apart from maybe if you know those that can get into doing can get into higher education probably have a really good education um, Okay, and then this, I think this is my favorite one, the University of Ennui. So this is where automation has basically taken over work, all the work. Um, and work is not our defining uh, activity anymore. Um, so everybody wants to go into university to do creative humanities um, and, and social kind of um, disciplines um, through their whole lives, there's no rush. Um, so humans are struggling to understand what we're for. I, I think that could be a real problem for universities in this completely unfeasible future. Okay, and this is the last one, so I just did drill into this one a little bit more. It's probably the most frightening. This, um, this one is about extinction era universities uh, where climate, climate disaster is underway. There's food and water insecurity, there are uprising, there's mass movement. Um, universities in response as kind of leading the global response both through research um, or primarily through research um, research focused on survival and uh, sustainability we still have an internet but um, it's very much restricted um, no commerce no pornography just research education community and government um, and borders are erased to support mass migration and university teaching becomes something which is supported through local learning collectives so I found when I've used these um, scenarios with various uh, groups often it's, it's this one which is the most frightening kind of one which actually has often been best at stimulating new topic thinking because you do colleagues do tend to think really radically in the context of climate change um, and perhaps that's because it starts it is, it is real we know that you know that and we hear more every day that the likelihood of us staying below two degrees of warming is becoming really quite slight very slight um, and increasingly academics climate scientists are um, urging us to plan for a climate end game um, so we know that this is the context we're working within um, and there's some really interesting, I'm coming to a close now, so I'm going to finish on time. Um, so there's some really interesting academic work going on now around what that might mean for the way in which we rethink what the university might become as an institution in the context of climate catastrophe, including uh, work on the end of institutions. And Ray Wynne Connell's um, 2019 book, she wasn't writing in the context of climate change, but I think she, but she did write really interestingly about universities changing from being sort of homogenous monolithic institutions to becoming way stations, sort of sites of learning which people pass through throughout life, sort of lighter touch um, collectives of scholarship um, and survival in this case. And we've also seen a lot of like, we, 
great work coming through over recent years from uh, colleagues like Sarah Ansler talking about um, ecoversities and how how in, at, at points of crisis it is these indigenous and anti-colonial focuses on autonomy and dignity that could actually shape the radical and political imaginary which we might need to continue to function as, as as a higher education collective at a time of um, crisis. And then there are academics who are talking really interestingly about um, how we might become differently technologized within universities. Um, we've become very dependent on high, the high usage of technology, and even more so now with AI, and we know that that has a calamitous kind of impact on uh, sustainability. So another one from Neil Selwyn, he wrote a recent paper on digital degrowth, talking about how we need to visit this idea of radically sustainable computing and we need to exercise constraint in the way we use digital technologies. Um, and I'm as guilty as anyone of kind of throwing technology at interesting teaching problems. Um, maybe we need to stop doing that. Um, um, and then there's, I really like Felicitas McGillchrist's work on the utopian rewilding of technology and the valuing of local collective commons-based approaches um, to, to technology and again focusing on deceleration and degrowth in the way we use technology. So I'm coming to the end of my talk and I realize it's been a bit of a kind of dash through a lot of different stuff but I think often um, colleagues say well, what am I supposed to actually do in the context of all this? Um, so my final slide is uh, about things that we might do um, now within universities. Um, uh, uh, we might demand fairer, more de democratically accountable technology infrastructures in our university. Um, we could do what McGill, Christ, and Selwyn are talking about in terms of advocating for restraint in the way we use digital technology. Um, we might, we're already actively engaging with the idea of diverse knowledges across most universities, but we could do more of that. And, uh, um, and we can, I think, I'll jump to the last one here, I think this question of imagining new utopias and reflecting on them collectively is actually one of the most powerful things we can do. I think if we give each other permission to imagine utopias, imagine hopeful futures and actually push beyond what, the, what currently seems possible, I think that in itself then becomes performative and starts to be the first step towards building um, differently. So I think I'll stop there, that's my last slide, and there is another link to the references. Thank you for listening. <laughs>
it's taken up by tenants. So we have people working in public sector, um, industry, third sector kind of organisations working in the, in the space of the university alongside students and research centres. Um, the idea being that this new building is where people will bump into each other and, and spark off each other. And the, the hope I, I think there is that we start to sort of then blur this boundary between university and work. Um, but perhaps on the on the terms of the university in a, in a way. So I think that's one approach is that you know sort of more sort of cohabit more cohabitation, more sharing of space and more sharing of intellectual agendas. I think that's probably a really important one. Um, in terms of the point you raised about extinction and, and Gaza, um, yeah, at the part of that the thinking behind some of that work um, and the utopia work generally was drawn from Jonathan Lear's book. I don't I'm sure colleagues here know it. Um, it was a fundamental hope in which he does a kind of um, a mapping of the leadership of um, the, the last chief of the Crow Nation who led the Crow Nation through a period of, it wasn't just profound change, it was a period in which everything that, 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 that those people lived by was taken away from them uh, through uh, kind of colonization. And it's a really a wonderful portrait of leadership which emphasizes how the task of the leader in that context is to create the conditions of possibility for radical and fundamental hope where it's hope for a future that you just cannot imagine or you cannot see as existing. So I, that was, I strongly recommend that book. I think it's relevant to a lot of the political context that we're working within at the moment. Um, so there was Stella's question, one online, and then colleague next to Chan said, Stella, if you go first, then you um, Thanks, Sean. Um, that was a, a great talk. And I love your work as well. When I was um, first joined um, LSE and was running the consultation, um, I'm the head of uh, digital education future skills by the of being concepts, but I'm really kind of I used your futures future teaching trends work to try and get people to think about what what different futures might look like, what a desirable future might look like, and take them out of the present. What do you say about you know people in roles like mine, teams like mine, who are in the present? You get people to think of a desirable future, but actually that's some way off. And, and it's quite a nice balance, actually, when you talk about kind of the digital being permeating through everything. It's really hard to imagine a future that's not a dystopia, you know, always connected, always um, contactable, always, you know, kind of like hyper connected is really negative. But actually, you might consider the use of technology to kind of turn off space-based focus and actually kind of create some space for technology. But then you move into the, okay, how do we get there? And you find yourself in the, okay, well, we need to understand what people need to do. We need to think about platforms. We need to see, think about, you know, requirements and projects and those kinds of things. And you start to lose that, um, that space to imagine something different. And I guess my question is, what's your advice I'm sorry, what's your advice for um, people trying to navigate a, a route to something quite positive that does accept that digital is part of that, but digital working well? Yeah, so do you mean um, in the context of like organisational change and actually making yeah. stuff happen within Absolutely. the university? Yeah, yeah, it's really hard. I mean, it's, it, in a way, it's 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 much easier to have these conversations with colleagues like here today or with students because um, people get it and people feel they have the freedom to think um, very differently. Um, what's more difficult is when you try and do work like this in committees or with groups that are, whose job it is to operationalize uh, strategic vision or strategic direction. Um, then it is really difficult. So I think the um, the Near Future Teaching Project, and that was this was a project that was a precursor to this work on speculative um, futures. Was it was an institutional project to co-design the future for digital education at Edinburgh. It was a two-year project. It was supported from the top level, but was a kind of grassroots sort of bottom-up project. And it, it was great. Something its outcomes were really great. We had we spoke you know, 400 or more students and staff were involved in developing that vision. Um, it was probably I think the first really genuinely participative piece of work that we've done at Edinburgh. Um, and I suppose one regret I have from that work is that we didn't attach an implementation plan to it because it was it was never intended as that. It was intended as a vision document and it, it was that. Um, but then we found that for that reason it was relatively easy to ignore when strategic kind of um, 
uh, and particularly resourcing issues were being kind of discussed. So I think attaching implementation plans to vision projects is quite good sometimes. But the risk there then is that you it, it tend, does tend to get pulled back to what's possible now in the present. So I think my sense, and I'm learning quite, well, I don't want to say I'm learning fast, I've been doing this kind of way for about seven years now, but I think, I think it's about iteration and sort of keeping the space of the future open, but also, also thinking in pragmatic terms about operationalizing as you go, and maybe in different forums, but trying to cover all bases. Yeah. Okay, um, so I'm going to move to a question online. Michele, could you just um, move the camera, please, please? So we have um, Keith Safdar online. He's going to come on uh, mic and read out the question. Hello, can you hear me? We can, yes. Yeah. Oh, wonderful. Um, hi, Professor Bain. Um, I work at LSE, but I'm also uh, a student at the University of Edinburgh in digital education. And um, I've read most of your papers um, with delight, although it's taken me some time to get my head around some of the ideas. Um, so it's great and fun to be able to uh, have this opportunity to ask you a question. I just wanted to ask um, regarding post-humanism and the paradigms of uh, moving beyond uh, technology as tool and breaking down the uh, dualistic perspective or binary perspective of subject object in the in a post humanism uh, post humanist perspective how would you integrate the post humanist perspective into a digital education strategy and if possible could you use ai at uh, higher education as an example um, yeah i mean i think in a way so that post humanism paper was uh, yeah maybe when did i write that about 4 or 5 years ago and i think in, in a way, we talk about it now all the time. We may not frame it as post-humanism or critical post-humanism, but actually now, particularly since the AI um, stuff started really kicking off, we're constantly talking about human-machine relations and the integration of human and machine intelligences and how we might work in partnership with the artificial intelligence and in partnership. So I think as a um, generally and collectively, we have moved away from this sense of technology is simply a tool. We know that it's it's not that the technological environments impact what we do and what is possible for us to do. Um, so I think, in a way, sometimes I, I do feel like the conversations we're having now, particularly around AI, have kind of superseded some of that some of that theory. So I'm I'm really glad you raised that question because I think we should probably go back to it and think again um, about some of that work in the context of what's happening now. Thank you. I I, I think can I just quickly add? I think part of the issue is. Um, the the way AI is being thought about, generative AI, for example, it's still fundamentally being seen with you know the potential negative effects of plagiarism, and as a tool that it is to be used at least when it comes to a strategy perspective of implementing it as part of um, um, the education process. I think that's where the challenge lies, and I, I completely agree. It's it's taken us by surprise and it is uh, a, dis a positive disruption in, in the way we are thinking and working. Thank you. Um, sorry, I don't know your name, and I've got no, one question in the room. No worries. I'm, I'm Philip Rode from LSE Cities and the School of Public uh, Policy. And with my colleague, Sava Verdes, we teach a lot uh, questions of urbanism, of placemaking, of uh, the physical encounter of people. Um, and I also do and nowadays, as you would expect, a lot of research how that equation around cities and physical space is changing as a consequence of the digital. When you were introducing the scenarios, I was in my mind trying to make sense of what is the implication for the physicality of the city as an institution, for what we're doing in this room with a degree of hybridity. And I wonder whether in your research, you actually look at this aspect of where does the place condition of being physically still in the same room still matter or not, whether that's a dimension you research on, you gather evidence around whether that features or whether that's sort of almost a separate world of academic engagement. Um, yeah, well, yeah, so we have done some research on this, although it's a bit like um, the previous question around AI, I think we should need to go back to it. So we did some work with um, on kind of um, new geographies of learning through distance education um, a, a while back. 
Um, and this was because we uh, were running a lot of large distance programs, yet students seemed to feel a very strong sense of affiliation to the university, and that included the, a kind of need to engage with the symbols of the university. So things like having an image of um, old college on their on their laptop with their screensaver, and sort of continually we developed this idea of uh, campus envy. Um, this idea that students who are studying at a distance, even though they were having a really good Good, really good experience. Um, often, that like that experience would be even better if they were on campus, which it, it probably it probably wouldn't because a lot of the strength of these programs was that they were designed for online. So we did we did some work there, uh, finding that actually the, the geographies and the orientations to space and place were not what we would expect with distant students. But I think that was well before COVID, you know, COVID and everything. I think it would be really interesting to go back to some of that work and actually look at it in the context of hybridity. It's a really, really good question. Okay, I think we have time for one last question if anyone has anything else. I'm looking online as well. I think any remaining um, comments or thoughts? Yeah, okay, for it, Neil. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, one, one other question I had was again, talking about my experience of talking to students, you know, there is a kind of dual reality here. One is the reality of COVID and the reality of this utopian type of future. And I think there's a, there's a tension there between wanting to engage with the utopianism but really finding more security in the current. And I wonder what, how I might advise students to, to, to manage that, that tension. Yeah, I wonder if this relates back to the issue you raised around risk and um, that sense of that we do a, a brave, bravery and whether it's okay to talk about requiring our students to be brave. Because I think sometimes um, sometimes asking people to imagine freely, it, it, it is almost an act of bravery or it, some, as a kind of courage anyway to think, you know, sometimes you might be saying something which just feels like it's, it's stupid or it's silly, but actually you're working within the realm of the impossible, which is where utopia kind of sits and it's important to feel you have the space to do that. Um, so I think that it's a really interesting question. I'm not quite sure how it would connect to your concerns around that terminology, but um, yeah, I need to think more about that one. Thank you so much. In that case, I'd really um, like to thank Sean once again for a very good